from generations, future generations of ethnographers, because everyone gets hung up on Tolik and 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 people. And this this is this is what really irritates me. I mean, autoethnography is supposed to be about cultural critique. So what about relational ethical cultures? And, and um, doesn't doesn't Tolik's paper deserve to be to be critiqued in that context? And, but everyone seems to accept it as um, you know some sort of authoritative position on on relational ethics. And uh, and and I think it it really stymies, it really interrupts and and gets in the way of a lot of auto I I'm a lot of autoethnographic work. I imagine there's quite a few. Um, I know, in fact, some of them. Are, there's quite a few postgraduate students, doc, masters, and doctoral students that are writing much more guarded, less open, less adventurous um, autoethnographies than would otherwise be the case if it wasn't for tolikism, as I've, as I've called it. So, right, so I wanted to frame it in terms of epi epistemic violence, in terms of uh, misogyny too. And um, uh, and basically, I see I see Tolik as a kind of, as I was saying to Chris earlier on, I see him as a, a methodological gate crasher. You know, he's um, he's someone that has no experience of autoethnography. He's a sociologist, sociology professor in, in New Zealand, who's got an interest in uh, qualitative research ethics, and he's making all sorts of judgments about, um, uh, you know, uh, relational ethics. Uh, and and uh, relational ethical decisions, and so he makes very simplistic. Uh, he, he, he makes very simplistic judgments about um, securing informed consent, both uh, anticipated and retrospective informed consent. And I just think he's wrong. He's wrong on so many levels. And I just went to town on him. Really, um, um, I found it. I had to separate out. What I described as Tolikism from from Tolik the man. I don't know Tolik the man, and I didn't want to get into ad hominem attacks on Tolik the man. But I certainly think his his everything he's talking about is um, needs needs vigorous uh, contesting. Hence the paper. There you go. That's my introduction to it. So I'm open to. The floor. Could I ask a question, Ellie, and then we'll um, please put hands up if you, you know, if you've got a question. How did how did it appear that Susan um, wanted to to sort of write this as well? Was it something part of her journey that around yeah. her PhD? Yeah. Well, I, I, Susan's an animator, um, and she. Um, she had a professional career in animation, international career in, in animation, and um, she she was also um, she's also a survivor of the of the institutional mental health uh, system, and she had she 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 she's so in her work, which consists of a written piece of work, um, I think it's uh, sixty thousand words for a PhD for a PhD, plus a couple of films. She uh, she comes clean about and she names names about uh, she was she was she she was uh, sexually abused within the the system and this 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 appears in her um, and she was abused um, before go getting into the system um, she nearly murdered by her ex husband and that's going to come out in her uh, uh, that's in the public domain uh, uh, in her films already which are in the public domain. Um, um, and in her, um, uh, and will be in her doctorate, and um, she's mentioned them in this, in this, uh, in this paper we wrote. And so her, 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 her <coughs> excuse me, her, her problem with Tolik is she saw Tolik as, as I do, as someone who wants to silence um, people from, from to stop them writing about their experiences. Mm, yeah. And and. Uh, like and who takes a very simplistic view of of um, securing informed consent? Because if you if you ask an abuser, mm -hmm. 
Uh, do you mind awfully if I if I tell about what you did to me mm. in this uh, autoethnographic uh, paper or book or, or doctorate? They're going to tell you to fuck off, are they not? Or worse? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, and then you, what are you supposed to do? You know, um, not write anything. Um, so, I, you know, Tollock as 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 a silencer of voices. So that was that was um, Susan's way into it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. That, that explains quite a lot. Um, I felt that way, but yeah, I can completely empathise with um, with Susan. Um, right, right. Yeah, through, through another different circumstance, but yeah, absolutely. Um, Val, is it? Go on, Val. Yeah, why do you think um, Tonic's kind of almost got the floor on this? Because, you know, when you start to look at um, relational ethics, I know that there are a lot of other writers, but it always seems everybody mentions Tonic, everybody talks. What is it about that that's made it so, maybe popular is the wrong word, but well-known or, you know? I, I really think, well, I think for several reasons. I think, I think um, he, he's a rhetorical writer, so he, he's a very persuasive writer. He writes as if he's speaking from unquestionable authority. This is the way things are. Institutional authority. You know, if you're a social scientist, autoethnogra autoethnography is part of social science. Therefore, you ought to ad adhere to um, uh, social science ethics. Um, he's um, uh, He claims the... the uh, the moral high ground and the ethical high ground around informed consent. Uh, he, he, his arguments work well in the context of qualitative inquiry more generally, but much less so. The, the closer you get to autoethnographic self, um, uh, self, self and life writing, the, the less uh, uh, compelling they are, the less convincing they are. But because he, he's He's claiming disciplinary, uh, the discipline of sociology, and institutional, uh, the, institu the institution of um, uh, uh, um, qualitative inquiry, uh, and also he's 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 relying on on the um, on Denzin's guidelines, which um, which are are a bit old now. And don't really apply, and and as you'll see in the article, have been uh, have been qualified um, and overrided to to a large extent. And also another reason, Val, is that he's he's probably the only one that's written about this so explicitly. And at the time, he was the only one on on the on the map that was was talking like this back in two thousand and ten. So I think these are the reasons. Mm. And he's just gone unchallenged, you know, and, and so hence our paper. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, I think um, Liana was saying something as well. Sorry, Liana, go on. You had a question. Uh. Yes, I just uh, wanted to say that I absolutely agree with this position, Alec, that you are suggesting. And generally, I think um, this kind of approach almost creates a discrimination or at the level of knowledge formation because any kind of excessive faith in one specific approach is epistemologically unsound and every approach i think we still have have a, a, this ability and are in a position to suggest an approach but we also have to acknowledge that every approach has its limits so i wonder whether you think that insisting otherwise leads towards dogmatic perceptions and what we call scientism yeah what, what do you think about that Alex? yeah that's that's a very good uh, that's a very good point uh, liana I think I think um, yeah you you could argue that 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 Tollick's coming from a, a scientific position you know social science is about this therefore uh, there's no question that you have to uh, be black and white about um, relational ethical rules so then it becomes dogma and 
and and not terribly it, dogma that doesn't really work in the real world. You know, it's it's and that's why I I, I made the analogy with Mary Whitehouse. You know. And Mary Whitehouse, bless her, was, um, if any of you are old enough to remember Mary Whitehouse, Mary Whitehouse was was well-intentioned, you know, a Sunday school teacher, uh, uh, Christian right woman, um, who, uh, <laughs> who, 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 if, if, Mary, if Mary Whitehouse had her way, you'd, you'd, you'd have all, a lot of, a lot of great films and artwork and Loads of other and, and um, informative documentaries about sexuality just wouldn't have appeared in the 60s. So she was a silencer, uh, I think. Um, and, and just as uh, I think uh, uh, Professor Tollock's a silencer um, and just as dogmatic too. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Alice. Yeah. Vicky's put a point in the chat. Um, thanks, Vicky, as well. About um, is he not talking about relational morals rather than relational ethics? Um, yeah. Do you want to pick up on that, Vicky? Yeah. Yeah, I was just thinking. Um, obviously, you know, it, it, I see a distinction between ethics and morals. I think ethics come from from within. You know, um, you know, our our own individual character, perhaps, whereas morals. Is a set of norms and I think so often in, in qualitative research and things like that you know these textbooks that we are so often told to go away and look at in terms of methodology and you know how, how we should approach our research um, you know outline a set of standards which then become you know the dominant discourse around how to do research um, and I was just wondering I think Alex left oh is he back yeah I'm back sorry Oh, I, sorry. I, like we didn't know we'd lost you then, but you're back. That's good. I thought I couldn't see your picture. Oh, what's the question again? Sorry, Vicky. Um, yeah, just um, briefly. You know, the distinction between ethics and morals. Obviously, ethics is much more about um, your individual character and how you respond, maybe to to other people. Whereas morals is perhaps a set of standards which we all kind of agree that you know how we should do things and 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 how qualitative research perhaps inadvertently does that through. Um, you know the the dominant research textbooks like of Crotty. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. just thinking about you know social science is, and then but then equally you know in educational um, research as well. Um, mm. But I, I I just wondered. It, I'm I'm not too familiar with autoethnography, so I'm I'm probably a little bit naive. So apologies. Um, but I was just wondering: is is it relational ethics, or or is he he's, is he putting a, a label on that which isn't actually um, accurate is it more about you know morals if he's if he's sort of putting a set of you know a standard out there that everybody should sort of live to uh, well i think he's doing both i think he's 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 addressing ethics from the from the perspective of what's the right thing as opposed to the wrong thing for for researchers to do and he's a um, he's a he's uh, addressing morals from from the perspective of What's it good to do, and 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 conversely bad to do, um, as a in general terms. So he's talking specifically about the ethical actions of individual researchers and, and the moral position of what qualitative inquiry should be about in terms of relational ethics. I think he's wrong on both counts. If, he, if he's talking specifically about what what individual researchers ought to do. Then, when you're actually uh, engaged in autoethnography and you're engaged in the the difficult, sometimes tortuous, hard to to negotiate or to to um, hard to um, resolve relational dilemmas and quagmires that you get involved in, I, I think that black and white, right or wrong, um, decision making is not appropriate. You just I don't I don't think you can you can think in those terms. I mean, I think I think the best you can do is do the best you can in the difficult circumstances you find yourself in. And sometimes that leaves you um, still in breach of relational ethical ideals. You just can't get away from that. Um, it just is, you know, um, 
So if you take, I mean, if you take Alice, as the example of Alice and her, and her mother, you know, Alice made on the spot decisions that were difficult. Alice knew Alice, Alice knew her mother. Tolik didn't know either of them. He didn't know the relational context. He didn't know. That's why I invoked um, Gian Battista Vico, you know, the philosopher, um, um, uh, Veramaps, Ver, Veramaps, Veramaps, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm tired this morning, Veramaps, Ipsum Verum Factum, you know, the decisions that are made through doing the work uh, that, that, that often people that are looking on just don't, don't get any kind of sense of or, or lived appreciation of, you know, they, they, so it's easy to make judgments if you're looking on as tall it was in a very simplistic black and white way. So I think to answer your question, Vicky, I think both ethically and morally, he's making a pitch, um, a critical pitch at autoethnography that I don't think stacks up. Yeah, and I, I was kind of agreeing with that in terms of actually, you know, him him suggesting that he's he's talking about relational ethics. Like you say, he doesn't know what the relational ethics is between those those individuals. Therefore, right. he's he's perhaps looking at it through through a, a moral um, relational lens, yeah. Yeah. His, his own lens, or or his own his own set standard or set of standards in terms of his own ethical relations. Which which. Uh, he doesn't really come clean about it. This is another reason why, to go back to, I can't remember who it was who asked the question, um, Liana, I think. Um, why, why is why is he, um, or Val, maybe, why is, it, why is Tolik so influential? Well, he doesn't, his is the voice of unexamined rightness, unscrutinised correctness, isn't it? He doesn't kind of, do a reflexive double take. He doesn't say to himself or to the readers, "Why do why do I find this problematic?" He just says it is problematic. Mm. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? Yeah, and and you said that yourself when when you said that when you're writing about this, you have to separate Tolik from Tolikism. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah. Don't know, you don't know the person. I don't know the person. No, no, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's really really relevant, and and I think that's something that came up when um, when we didn't have that round table, Val, wasn't it? Two years ago, it was something that you know we don't know who, and in narrative writing of all sorts of kinds, you know, you you find out something about the author, don't you? And for Tolik, you don't seem to find out anything about him unless you you look somewhere else. Um, so yeah, that's that's another problem. Another problem that I had as well. Totally agree with what what's just been said. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anybody else got any thoughts? Yeah, go on, Frank. I was just sorry, I've got a sore throat. Um, I was just going to say, given that the article is ten years old, um, and I haven't looked into his background or you know any of the other writings around him, but have other people? You know, has he not been challenged on this earlier or has, has he been taken pretty much as, you know, the yardstick, the norm and, and the way to go? I think the latter, Frank, I, th I don't think he's been challenged. I, I haven't seen, you know, I had a look, I couldn't find anything. Um, I think people grumble about him behind the scenes, as it were, you know, behind the, you know, they don't. But in print, he's been just regarded as you know, fairly authoritative, canon, canon, canonical, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, an authority on, on relational ethics. Um, uh, you know, in, in qualitative inquiry more generally too. So, um, and it, it is, it is quite, quite surprising that, that he's, he hasn't, his paper didn't provoke more, more discussion at the time and afterwards. Because that kind of thinking, <clears throat> excuse me, has found its way so much into institutional um, ethics committees, protocols, you know, memorandums of, of how to do things, how to undertake research. And as you say, um, you know, it's like carrying an albatross on your back sometimes and, and the ability to sort of be creative or um, 
you know, put light and shade into your work, sort of make your work interesting. Some of that can get drained out because yeah. of every turn. Um, yeah. Even where, where you don't um, identify people by name or whatever, where they appear in your story, um, you know, potentially they could be identified just by, you know, the way you've described them, the situation yeah. you, um, they occur in when you write about them. And I come across this quite a lot in my own writings. And, and my default position, sort of like going back to uh, Tollich and, and some of, you know, Edge Hill and other um, kind of larger kind of social science um, so, sort of ethical guidelines, is, is just take it, take it out. But I feel that my writing then becomes, you know, it's like yeah. paint, paint thinner in, in your paint and sort of uh, yes, all, all the colour and the, you know, the character and the richness yeah. of the work is at yeah. risk of being sort of bleached out. And it, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, a good, that's a very good uh, metaphor there. I see someone, I think it was Val, said I mean, that... Paint my railings. Okay. Val said that, that Pat Sykes has written about... Uh, um, Pat's a friend of mine. I, I haven't. Um, I think people. I, I suppose people will have will have written in in direct opposition to what Tollick's saying, or just by dint of what they write, they just there's and myself included here. I, I'm just a Tollick ignorer. You know, uh, uh, if I, I I'd have self Tollick myself out of existence if I'd listened to him. And I don't, and um, he can sort off <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. But I mean, um, yeah, paint thinner. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's watered down. Who who wants to write watered down autoethnographies? You know, they're just boring, anodyne. It's like corn soup without any corn in it or something. I don't know. Paint thinner. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, uh, thanks, Frank. That is a good. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it reminds me of what I was talking to Alec a few moments ago about um, about I, I felt constrained writing my thesis. I felt really constrained by mm. by the ethical board, and like Louise has just mentioned in the chat about you know I felt I had to write in a certain way because of the the, yeah. the ethical board, and I did. Yeah, uh, and it wasn't. It's yeah. it's not it's not great to read. It really isn't. Don't don't well, bother reading my thesis. <laughs> that, that, that's why that's why he writes with institutional authority. Why why is he so influential? Well, ethical boards are going to read what Tollick says and say, "Well done, Professor Tollick. That's exactly right." Yeah. Um, but ethical boards are so are such blunt tools. Uh, your average. Uh, IRB or or whatever the I can't remember what the term is in Britain that we use uh, research ethics committees when they're judging autoethnography they're they're like blunt tools that they're, they're just not fit for purpose especially if you get a few hard scientists on them mm. uh, you know and um, and so they're like they're like you know incarnations of of group incarnations at all like so. Yeah, I think we need, um, hopefully, um, in the future, and this is what Denzel was, was, was talking about when I quoted him, when I cited him, is, um, is new forms of, of new, new, new committees to judge uh, in terms of the, the ethics appropriate to each individual piece. And I think that's, that's where people like Andrew Sparks come in, my pal Andrew Sparks. I mean, he, him and a few others are saying, look, look you, you need to judge each autoethnography auto on its own merits. You can't make blanket black and white rules. You can make some general principles, of course, that are flexible and, and nuanced, but you really have to take each piece um, uh, in... Um, on its own merits and, and, and think about the the internal ethical issues of each piece. What was that you're saying, Val, about Ellis? Yeah, when I started off doing autoethnography, you know, and I, I kind of take the point about Tollett, but for me, I, I do like a little framework. <laughs> I felt it kind of gave me, not his necessarily, but something like that gives me some reassurance. Of course, um, yeah. yeah and absolutely. I wrote to Karen and it's about the sort of very idea of ethics because it does worry me 
Um, my, I write a lot about my experience as a carer for my daughter who's got a severe learning disability. Yeah. And um, she came back to me and she said that at her university, they kind of went through automatically without having um, yeah. to jump through the hoops, if you like. like bypass, you the bypass, the bypass, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Which would just be brilliant here, because trying to get anything through as it's remotely. Yeah. Well, I think Alice and, and a few other people out there, one of the ways they do it is just to say this isn't, they just don't call it research, call it inquiry or something, or they, they say it's not. And so they, they, they excuse themselves from going through the IRBs, the institutional review boards out there. Mm. Um, because, yeah, and for good reason. I, I understand why they're doing it. Um, mm. is, is that the best solution, though? I don't know. Um, yeah, does that mean it gets left out uh, of, of the conversation? Yeah. Yeah. Which it's is, a deferred which... conversation, isn't it? Yeah. How, how do we judge? How on what grounds and according to what criteria do we judge mm. the ethical um, soundness of a particular piece of work? Is it by total avoidance? Mm. Uh, that doesn't feel too too um, too ethical to me. Uh, yeah, that's right. Say. Go on, Liana. You had a question or comment? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I just want to say that, uh, Alec, you write about epistemological violence and... Uh, epistemic I mean, violence, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was wondering what epistemic or epistemological, I think, is it the same thing? I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm wondering now whether looking at Tolik's proposal, and though I do take on board what Val is saying about having certain framework. I think we all want to have certain guidelines in terms yeah. of justifying, but um, would you say that Tolik's suggestions create another issue for institutions and for researchers in terms of silencing the researcher? Because the role of autoethnography really is to work with the voices that have been silenced before, so to give these people voice. But at the same time, when we think about these voices as the other, because in autoethnography we all also admit that there is no one stable self, in a way the researcher also becomes the other in this sense, because you have a your reflexive self, you have your uh, particip participant self, you have your researcher self. So from my position, this um, paper from Tolik creates a um, very strict uh, framework, which actually is aimed at silencing the researcher, which is another ethical issue. What, what do you think? Well, yeah, I, I agree. I, I, first of all, and this is getting back to Val, I don't think frameworks per se are, are bad. They're they're very good, and and as you say, um, you know, when you when you start out, you do need some some sort of parameters, some sort of holding framework. I think Sparks and, and quite a few other people. I mentioned him in the paper, Andrew Sparks, and a few other yeah, people. Sparks. Certainly, certainly, I, I advocate uh, and write about frameworks, but they do it in a nuanced uh, and and. Um, and flexible way. Um, I, I think, yeah, you're, you're. I think you're right, Liana. I think, I think Tolik collapses all the selves, you know, the, the reflexive self, the the, um, the critically reflexive self, the uh, researcher self, the participant self. He collapses them all into a simple kind of monochromatic black and white picture. Uh, where people, um, the, the options people have are so constrained, you know, it's like you could draw a little diagram, if this happens, do this, if this happens, do that, you know, and it takes the, the heart and soul out of research and, and life's not like that. It's like, imagine you had a, it's like painting by numbers. Imagine, imagine you had a painting by numbers guide to falling in love, make eye contact. Yeah, um, if she smile, if if he smiles, sorry, if he smiles, um, smile back. Um, if if you're going to meet her, 
wait, put on, uh, you know, have a good, a nice shower and put on some cologne. It's like that, you know. It's it 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 it, it takes away all the messiness. I mean, life's not life and research just isn't like that. So I think there are lots. Of, so I think you can you can play around with the idea of the researcher self, the troubled self, the the um, I don't know what the fuck I'm going to do now self. You know, I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know how to resolve this self. Um, do I do I show this bit of writing to this person or not? If I do, what's going to be the damage? Is it is it is it going to make things worse? Is it going to make our relationship worse if we do it retrospectively or prospectively? So there's all these kind of issues, and you're, you're struggling with these, and it's a it's a it's a real messy, difficult task. It's really hard work. Autoethnography is a very very hard um, discipline, I think, if you're going to do it and you're going to get into it and do it um, do it in depth. Um, if you just skim the surface and just write nice little stories, you know, then there's no problem at all. And I think that's that. If you if you took tolicism on board, that's all you'd be left with. Just little one dimensional, boring stuff that, you know, Frank's paint thinner, you know, stuff, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I totally agree there as well. Has anybody? I'm just curious if anybody wants to to share. But has anybody um, made these relational ethical decisions? Um, you know, I, I write about family members, for example, but I've never actually formally asked my family members, "Can I write about you?" You know, um, I've shown them my writing after I've written it the ones I can show um, and the ones I can't show I can't show them to, I can't show it to them um, because I don't have any contact with them anymore um, so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are everybody about those relational decisions you know to do with people that you might not be able to show your writing to like Alice Alice was able to show her writing to her mother even though it was partial um, I'm just wondering what you think go on Liana Can't hear Liana, is she there? Shall we shall we move on to Sally for a minute? I can't hear Liana. We'll come back to Liana. Hi, um well I'm I'm not an autoethnographer, um, but I am supervising um a master student, Rosie Bean, who's doing something uh, in that that vein. And um I'm, I'm a sociologist by training, so that's why I'm. Um, so, but but this is a really interesting point because um, I I'm interested in this idea of anonymity and consent because um, if you're writing about yourself, you know, uh, and maybe something that, and then you kind of you're going to write about your family in relation to that. Um, Obviously, they're not anyone who read your piece would know who your mother was. Mm -hmm. um, so this is probably a really basic question, but how do you how do you deal with that mm -hmm. um, in terms of ethical approval, or or how do you deal with it even you know as a researcher yourself? Mm. Is that a question for me or for Christine? Yeah, yeah, for you, Alex, if, if you don't mind. Not at all. Uh, well, I think I think providing the and this is where it's easy, a lot easier in mainstream quality of research. And that was my background before I got into ethnography. If you're doing uh, mainstream quality of inquiry and you're writing about other people, uh, usually the topic and the issues uh, are often um, sufficiently um, aren't going to kind of make the person who you're you're naming feel necessarily embarrassed. Perhaps they were a, 
a willing participant in your research in the first place. They've, they've, they've been involved, got involved in your research through informed consent procedures, etc. But I mean, imagine you're writing about um, And I'll, I'll, I'll use my own experiences now. People in your past that have been abusive towards you, really abusive, and I'll, I'll draw on other people's autosnographies too. People in, the, in your past that have not just uh, uh, abused you emotionally, but abused you sexually, and even tried to murder you. Now, Ellis makes the point after a fellow called Tony Hoagland that uh, sometimes mean writing is is outweighs the need to to get um, consent to to name these people and to describe their actions. In other words, it's better for society. It's better in the, in the interests of social justice. It's better that these experiences and the people who who um, perpetrated those experiences. I'm also thinking about um, Carol Rambo's work on on um, her own sexual abuse at the hands of her her father. It's often uh, important to, in the interest of social justice, to describe the events as they happened, and to and to indicate who 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 uh, who the perpetrators were. Because if you didn't, you would never write the research. So I think the more you get away from just ordinary um non-abusive experiences into seriously abusive traumatic trauma creating experiences the more i think it is justifiable to um to um to, to name the people um that were um who, who's who, who perpetrated abuse and you, and you suffer from that abuse um and that's exactly where I think Tolik is absolutely wrong. And Tolikism is wrong. Because how how on earth would and it, a way out of it would be to fictionalise the story to to, to 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 write about it as though you're writing about someone else to disguise all the names to use composites, um, under under reverse you know to collapse. A number of a number of people into one person, or one person into several people. Um, I can't remember the guy who does that. I think uh, Clough does it in education. Is it Clough? A few other people. But sometimes it's and I think Susan made the point in in the paper. Sometimes it's, it's really important, you know, to for agency that you actually name unashamedly and unapologetically name the people. In the interests of social justice, um, and in the interests of the therapeutic um, uh, the therapeutics of 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 life writing, of autoethnographic writing, so it's it's really helpful to work through uh, personal trauma through writing. So, answer your question, Sally. Um, yeah, thank you. That comment there, that's Rosie. That's my master's student on the side. Um, I think it's a wonder whether you have any thoughts on that. I can't see the comment. Uh, oh, she says, um, I'm just wondering how well some participants can actually offer informed consent if they're not from a research background yet are affiliated with you in some way. For my study, there would be reference to childhood friends who I'm still in contact with, and knowing that their consent would allow me to write my dissertation would most likely lead them to saying yes to being present in the stories that will be used in the research without fully appreciating what their consent means. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And I make the, I make the point in this article um, about informed consent that informed consent is never informed consent because you don't get all the context. <coughs> you don't get all the backstories, do you? What am I consenting to? What am I signing up to? If someone says... Do you agree uh, to 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 me for me to use your name, your voice in this paper? Uh, I don't know all the backstories. I don't know all the context. Uh, I could look at a, it's a, it's a bit like looking through a narrow lens. 
I could look at what's what's asked of me through a, through a narrow lens. And that's all. That's the only lens I've got. This is the question: Do you agree to me to me representing you in this piece of research by saying this about you, or to to use your quote um, uh, that you that you said? And I say, okay, yeah, I don't mind you doing that. But I could say, I could say, um, all right, but I want to know, I, I want to know uh, much more about it. I want to know all the backstories. I want to know all the stuff that you're not showing me. Um, how far, how wide, how wide do you make the lens? And 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 sometimes when you ask researchers that, the researchers don't know themselves, do they? You don't know. You don't know. Um, uh, so, so, for example, if I, if you seek informed consent from me, and I say to you, "What's the likely outcome? What's what will be the kickback of me agreeing to this when the research is published, say in two, three years, or ten years down the line?" You can't answer that, can you? You don't know. So, informed consent is always narrow lens informed consent. And sometimes it's 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 courteous and important to ask for that, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's it's going to um, it's going to you know if, if if someone says no, absolutely not, I do not agree whatsoever. Then what do you do? Um, you're, you're left in a position to, to you could you could carry on. You could you could publish. You could write about you could write your story nevertheless and say this is interesting politically. He he didn't want me to say this, but I I, I made the decision not to respect uh, his decision because I think it's really important that that this story gets told. So that's a political decision that's made on the back of an informed consent request that got that got turned down. Are you with me? Yeah, absolutely. You understand yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, there used to be when I worked at Bangor University, there was um, we had a social scientist who was on the um, institutional, you know, ethics committee, and he managed to get like a clause about informed consent about um, informed consent whether it would affect the if it would affect the validity of the findings. You know, then informed consent could be, you know, wavered in certain circumstances, and I think that was a really good, it was a really good thing because it allowed the ethics committee to deal with each case on a case by case basis rather Certainly. than kind of yeah. wielding a sort of cookie cutter. Because you see, social I just think social scientists really struggle now to get things through because of that kind of one size fits all. Yeah. Kind of idea, yeah. Thank you very much. Absolutely, I totally agree with you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. 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 Liana, did you have your hand up before? And um, no, are you okay? Yeah. It's certainly. Um, it certainly made me feel empowered, Alex. So thank you to you and Susan for for writing that. I, I do feel um, that it, it's given me somewhere else to go, and I'm I feel not silenced, not as silenced. <laughs> we had a little conversation about this before, about um, you know, because there are limits to what we will share, what we can share, um, um, to be comfortable in the way that you relate to. Uh, people that you're writing about and um, I think those are decisions you have to make aren't they? I, I think I think I think also this is this is something I didn't I, I don't think I mentioned this in the paper um, and <clears throat> I think I think it's also a, an issue of temperament I mean I, I, I am temperamentally inclined to be open and um, some might say a bit psychopathic <laughs> about uh, what I choose to write about, um, I don't, I don't, I don't send censor, self censor myself as much as a lot of other people do, um, you know. And I think that's that's a function of my my temperament. Um, uh, hopefully, it's not a kind of exhibitionist 
uh, it's not a, a feature of exhibitionism, um, but I, I, I sometimes feel, you know, when, I, when, I, when I, I've done a lot of research supervision, you know, PhD supervision when I when I worked at the University of Brighton as a reader there for years and former retirement and, and masters, so masters and professional doctorate supervision. I often find a lot of a lot of postgraduate students and and co-supervisors are very are very kind of very kind of prissy and overcautious in my estimation about oh you can't write that and you can't write that and oh, don't do that and don't say that and oh, you know and 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 it's like Frank's paint stripper you know the poor and more paint stripper into the paint all the time you know um, and I found myself actually encouraging people to be much more adventurous mm. to say. Um, I'll give you I'll give you a few examples. I'm, I'm just reading a wonderful book um, uh, um, um, on uh, w women and ideas, women in philosophy, and um, uh, Nigel Warburton, who's one of the interviewers. It's the Philosophy Bites series. He's he's talking about the tendency in 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 writing. Uh, and this in philosophy writing and social science writing too. Mm -hmm. so it's when someone someone mentions a swear word, right? You put the first letter and you put the last letter and you put a load of asterisks. And he calls that kind of peekaboo coinness because everyone knows that F asterisk 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 C K rather is it means fuck. So why don't you just write fuck? That's what was said and that's what you feel. Well, write fuck, yeah. You know, the, 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 there's a whole there's a whole um, philosophical argument to be made about um, the decision making you have to engage and to, to to think about whether you should use swear words in terms of the effect <laughs> it's going to have on people. But that's a that's a related story. But you know, when people either avoid swear words, for example, um, I think these are the very fee, the very fee, the very people that would avoid. Not just swear words, but would avoid uh, talking about things just in case someone got upset along the line, you know. That's really interesting what and, you're saying. Sorry, I mean, sorry. What you say, what you say, Chris, and what 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 really offends me and upsets me is is very cautious writing. <laughs> I, I turn into Billy Connolly or Frankie Boyle and I say to myself, well, fuck off, you know. <laughs> Oh, yawn, yawn, yawn. Yeah. No, that's that's fantastic because um, I, I've just written a chapter for a, a, an edited book that's going to be published uh, at some point in the next couple of months, I think, um, on family estrangement. And w the scenario that I'm writing about, um, one of the participants, one participants, I'm saying like a researcher here, <laughs> one of the members of the narrative at one point says, uh, says f off don't come back here again and i put in my my draft you know star 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 and sent it into the editors and they changed it and put fuck off <laughs> and i sent it back and said in a little <laughs> in a little annotation i said can i say that you know can i really say that in a draft so uh, are in are in the actual published piece so yeah that's well, that, that was a point of learning for me. <laughs> well, to the extent that, that and this is uh, contra what Tollock's saying, to the extent that, and we make this point in the, in the article, the extent that um, autoethnographies um, are part of uh, part of the humanities, not just not not just social sciences. If you read uh, literature, if you read, um, I don't know, or, or see a film, do people censor their swearing? Do they? In films and uh, and novels, I was still uncomfortable with it, but yeah, it's it seems if, if, different if, because it's written, doesn't it? And well, well, why? Why? If you yeah. if you read if you read, um, and also it depends on on the on the on the on the part of speech that the the word refers to. If you read, uh, um, um, Lady Chatterley's Lover, and you and you read the words fuck and cunt. In Lady Chatterley's Lover, that norm that nearly got it banned in 1962-63, wasn't it? 
uh, these words are just descriptive words. They're 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 um, they're not abusive. They're not. It's not the same as saying "fuck off." You can't, is it? And if, if you if you if you if you read literature, and I think if you want to if you want to get some exemplars, some good role models for for autoethnography, then read a few good novels. Read read Irving Welsh. Read Train Spotting. Imagine train spotting without any swear words. If you purport to be doing autoethnography and you don't come from a tolicus position where you're saying, I am totally in the institutional social science camp, and you say to yourself, I'm I'm influenced by social science, but I'm also I also see myself as as um as as in the humanities camp. What 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 are the implications then for censoring what I write? And what's acceptable? Who says that just because something's written down and it's a piece of social social research in the name of autoethnography that it shouldn't contain uh, expletives? On what tablet of stone is that carved, Christine Lewis? <laughs> Yeah, that's a very good point. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Frank. Frank, yeah. Yeah, just a little note to end on, really. <clears throat> Excuse me. You mentioned the Lady Chatterley trial. I remember the judge, when he summed up, didn't he say, um, not the kind of book you would want your wife or your servants to read? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It kind of says it all, really, doesn't it, in terms of, <laughs> uh, you know, pr prescriptive authoritarian voices and uh, people exactly. saying who, who can and what. Can or can't be said by others. Yeah, Mary Whitehouse meets Tolick meets the judge and the lady Charlie's trial. Yeah, don't be a constant, or what, you, what the other guy's name was. Yeah, that'd Game. be an interesting drinks party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anything uh, else? Anything else before we wind up? I could listen all day. To, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So many touches on so many things, um, and you know, Christian, we, we spoke about this on one of the last ones about before you get into the whole thing of informed consent and what it means and whether you can whether people can give it and what the, you know and it's not a static thing anyway it moves um, you know whether you can guarantee anonym, anonymity to people which I don't think you can anyway um, you know it, it's a whole Pandora's box isn't it consent. Um, ethics. Yes, yes. Um, you know, yes. some people, some people anonymize whole, you know, not just their study sites, but but an entire town. Um, yeah. what, what's all that about? Not only could you find out quite easily, you know, with a bit of googling or whatever, but yeah, I, I don't know. Um, mm. I've got yeah. to the point now where you know, I've got photographs of animals, and you know, I've got no consent off them. Well, that's another point. I mean, well, if absolutely, you, non-human subjects. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's, my arrogant speciesism. If you move beyond anthropocentric writing, absolutely. how do you get inform? How do you get informed consent from animals, or should you? How would you do it? Um, is it important? Um, I wonder what. I mean, I'm sure Tollick would would probably not might think that was a ridiculous question. Um, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah. Yeah. Good thought. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much, everybody. Has, has anybody got any um, burning questions um, before we before we wind up? Can I just leave you with? Um, I've just I I, I I was course leader for the um, for a master's module in quality of research at the University of Brighton for years, and I was teaching some um, health students, um, health postgraduate students. And there was a paper written by a couple of Scandinavian uh, professors, and it was a standard quality of research. And they'd done quality of research of the use of humour in rest homes, and their participants, and what their participants said, talked about in 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 order to keep their their spirits up and maintain uh, a good uh, sense of humour in difficult circumstances. And they start these guys. There were a couple of guys. They started. It was the most, and ironically, it was the most unfunny paper you'd ever want to write to read. It was dry and boring. They started off the the paper with saying uh, a lot of our participants used swear words 
when they talk to each other. And because this is a piece, this is an acad this is an academic paper. It's absolutely not I'm not appropriate to use these swear words. So these got deleted. There was just lines through. It's a blank and a line, you know. And I right. If I was a participant in in that re research, I'd tell these guys to fuck off. If you're going to censor my words. Yeah, I don't give you consent to censor my words. They didn't ask these these participants, do you mind if we censor your swear words? They just took it upon themselves, tolicist, in a tolicist way, to do that. I think that's uh, that's 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 dreadfully unethical. Is it not? Yeah, so. Do you not think so? It's it's certainly exploiting, you know, the, the much vaunted um, unequal power relationship between researcher and researched. It, it was ages too. Young, youngish researchers versus old people that shouldn't be swearing, passing judgment on them. Mm. And it was investigating how they kept their spirits up. And if they kept their spirits up by telling um, jokes or, um, or, you know, talking to each other, using real language that people, you know, when you talk to each other, you don't go around not swearing, do you? Unless you're Mary Whitehouse or something. So I wonder how they'd approach participants with, with Tourette's. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Be a lot of black lines. Dearing me. Mm. Yeah, anyway, lovely to see you all again. Thank you so much, um, Alec. If anybody's got any questions, then please, please drop me a line, and I'll we can forward them to Alec, can't we? And then get them, uh, get them sorted. Uh, lovely discussion as always. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, thanks, Alec. Thanks all. For wisdom, yeah. And I hope you'll visit us um, in the new academic year at some point after yeah, September. That, Alec. Yeah, That'd yeah. Be great. I'll send you my um, my. Um, Philosophy paper, Chris, too. Yeah, I look yeah. a bit to that. Please, yeah, we can talk philosophy next next session. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye bye. All the best. Yeah, bye, bye now. All the best. <laughs>